Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's my second time in these conferences and I always enjoy it. It's a, it's a very diverse set of topics. Unfortunately, my talk is out of context in this session. It's not going to be about skirmions. Uh, because of some shuffling in the schedule, uh, it has been moved uh, up. Uh, and I'd like to tell you about some of the recent work we've been doing that looks at um, unconventional superconductivity. And I'll explain what I mean by unconventional superconductivity. Uh, and in particular, the unconventional type that I'll be talking about is one that arises uh, from the incompatibility between magnetism and superconductivity. Um, so I'll talk about two types of unconventional superconductivity and that you'll see eventually come together in one particular realization. So the first type is known as FFLO, uh, after the four uh, authors that uh, conceived this mechanism, Fulda Farrell, Larkin, and Pchinikov. Um, and what they were considering, of course, we know that superconductivity uh, relies on the condensation of electron pairs. These pairs have opposite spin and opposite momentum so that the pair wave function is isotropic in space. There is no net momentum and is also isotropic in spin space, angular momentum. Uh, and is translationally invariant. So it's maximally symmetric, and that's what I would call conventional superconductivity. Most BCS-type conventional superconductors have this kind of property for their uh, pairing. Uh, the, the first unconventional superconductivity I'll mention is uh, the one that these gentlemen uh, thought of, and it came about fairly soon after the introduction of BCS theory. Uh, and what they were considering is an itinerant ferromagnet where one has two, up, two separate Fermi surfaces for spin up and spin down. And you see that if one would like to pair opposite spins and opposite momentum, one encounters a problem. Because uh, one spin species lives in the inner Fermi surface. And so if I select a down here and want to choose the opposite momentum with the opposite spin, uh, you see that that cannot be satisfied. Uh, and what they hypothesized is that in this particular system, uh, the system would actually spontaneously choose a wave vector, Q. You see that there is a net momentum to this pair. It's not centered around zero. Uh, the system will spontaneously choose a momentum and will uh, condense all pairs into that momentum. And if there is something that breaks translational symmetry, like a boundary in the system, then the order parameter will have a wave vector component, will, will acquire this kind of translationally broken symmetry, uh, representing this kind of wave vector that the pairs have. Now, of course, this is not something very, uh, you know, the system doesn't really want to form this very much. And so the only examples that I could really dig out in bulk materials for this FFLO phase uh, are in some very special types of superconductors, in particular, very close to where superconductivity is just about to disappear. Uh, this is some results from an organic superconductor where you can see that at very high magnetic fields, they believe that this FFLO state, some kind of spontaneous breaking of translation symmetry for the order parameter is forming, uh, and then superconductivity disappears. Now, the other type of unconventional superconductivity I'd like to, to talk about today is that of topological superconductivity. And I'm not going to describe in detail what a topological superconductor is. I'm just going to try to rely on your intuition of what a topological insulator is. So we know that in a topological insulator, when we put the Fermi energy in the gap between valence and conduction band, for a conventional insulator, a trivial insulator, the Fermi energy lies in the gap and there are no states whatsoever. Whereas for a topological insulator, there are some states on the boundary. A topological superconductor, an analogy with the topological insulator, is one that has a bulk everywhere in, a, a gap everywhere in the bulk. Uh, it is a superconducting gap, so it's very different from the insulator, but nonetheless, the system is gapped everywhere. And conventional superconductors have nothing on their boundaries, whereas topological superconductors have edge states that live inside this gap. And these are Majorana states, they're called Majoranas, they have some different properties, they actually carry half the degrees of freedom of electrons. And these are the creatures that one is trying to use when one localizes them, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, 
uh, for what's called topological quantum computing. And I'm not going to talk at all about topological quantum computing. Uh, so topological superconductors are also ones that uh, are unconventional because of this kind of boundary states that they possess. And again, nature is quite unkind in giving us examples of where bulk, of bulk materials that are topological superconductors. And the only example that I know firmly, actually not really, again, neither example is really experimentally verified, but one is the fractional quantum Hall effect that filling factor five halves is believed to be a topological, uh, an effective topological superconductor uh, where uh, the system will hose Majorana excitations. And here's another example of strontium ruthenate, uh, which also is believed to be a p-type superconductor that might uh, be topological. And I want to emphasize that every topological superconductor has triplet pairing, namely similar spins or uh, instead of a singlet wave function, up, down, minus, down, up, it's a triplet wave function. But not, uh, not every triplet superconductor is necessarily topological. Now, because it is so hard to find bulk example of either unconventional superconductors, uh, the community has really invested a lot of time thinking about hybrid devices. What happens if we take two conventional materials uh, and put them together? Do we get something emergent from, the, from, the hi from this hybrid? So we know the conventional proximity effect. You put a superconductor next to a normal metal, and if the superconductor has some singlet pairing, up, down, minus, down, up, uh, that singlet pairing amplitude will leak into the normal metal, and this is what gives us rise to the Josephson effect, for example, etc. But if the superconductor had no triplet pairing, it will not emerge in the normal metal. But something interesting actually happens if you put a superconductor next to a ferromagnet. Here, again, the superconductor is a conventional one, so it only has this kind of singlet pairing, opposite spins, opposite momentum, net zero angular momentum. Uh, but when you look at the induced order parameter inside the ferromagnet, you see that the triplet pairing, despite the fact that it started out zero, is oscillating. The singlet component is also oscillating, and they're oscillating out of phase, one with respect to the other, so that when the singlet part vanishes, the triplet peaks. And this oscillation here has a wave vector, a typical wavelength, that is exactly uh, related to the FFLO phase that I described before. It has to do with the imbalance of spin up versus spin down, the different sizes of the Fermi surfaces inside this ferromagnet. The problem, however, with most ferromagnets is that as you increase the magnetization, you make it into a stronger and stronger ferromagnet, this wave vector becomes smaller, beca so, so the wavelength becomes shorter and shorter, and the decay length becomes faster and faster, so that Nearly with every ferromagnet that you put in close proximity to a superconductor, the order parameter is nearly non-existent uh, over already atomic distances. So it's really hard to see these kind of effects. And experiments that have demonstrated this kind of physics were really looking on the nanometer scale uh, of uh, proximity. Uh, so Similarly, if one wants to create topological superconductivity, one can look at hybrid devices. And uh, what we've learned from the past decade or so is that if you take conventional phases, like a conventional normal superconductor, like aluminum, uh, conventional magnets, and you combine them, you create hybrid devices with materials that have strong spin-orbit interaction. These are not very complicated. They're not unique. You can even use topological insulators. Uh, for example, uh, shown here. What this gives rise to, for example, the combination of superconductivity, magnetism, and topological insulator can give rise to helical Majorana modes, which are some kind of edge modes that exist in a superconductor that run only in one direction. Uh, and what I'll be talking about today is a hybrid that simply combines a conventional superconductor with a semiconductor that has some spin-orbit interaction. And as you'll see, this gives you both types of unconventional superconductivity that I was mentioning. The first is just triplet pairing, so uh, this kind of FFLO phase. And the second is uh, topological superconductivity with all the interesting aspects of localized Majorana zero modes and their uh, uh, related braiding. Uh, non-trivial braiding statistics. 
Uh, the devices that we're going to be considering are very, very simple. You see them here. The light blue here is the semiconductor, and on top sits this kind of silvery thing, which is aluminum, just the superconductor. Here you see a real uh, scanning electron micrograph of the device. This central ridge here is where the electrons live. And then uh, these are the two superconductors. And then on top of that, we have still yet another metal uh, gate to control density in the system. But it's basically just the Josephson, a superconductor, normal superconductor device. It's seemingly very simple and yet uh, really hosts a lot of rich physics. The way we probe it is by looking at what the Josephson current is. Okay? So we know that when we have a superconductor, normal superconductor junction, we can send supercurrents. And here you see a plot of the supercurrent which is the vertical axis, as a function of a little bit of magnetic field that threads this junction. Uh, and what you see here is something very familiar. It's a Fraunhofer interference pattern. The total maximum critical current uh, is falling off uh, in an oscillatory manner. Uh, every time we thread one flux quanta through this device, we get a node in the critical current. Uh, and so this is something very typical. In fact, it's teaching us something important about this device, and that is that the current is flowing more or less uniformly through the device. Uh, now, instead of taking this kind of full image at any given magnetic field, and now the, the really interesting parameter is the in-plane magnetic field. This is the variable that we're going to vary. And note, here we have a perpendicular magnetic field that's in the millitesla range, so it's small. We're going to be applying an in-plane magnetic field, which is in the hundreds of millitesla range, up to a tesla or so. So we're going to just look at the lowest line here. So what this line here corresponds to is sending a small current, DC or AC current through the device, and looking at the, the resistance of the device. And so the system, because it's a, a superconductor, uh, it has this Josephson effect, it develops zero resistance every time you're in the lobes, and the resistance shoots up to its normal value when you're at the nodes. So this kind of differential resistance is already capturing nearly everything that we need about this pattern. And we're just going to be following this resistance here as we're varying the in-plane magnetic field. And you see it here. Nothing really happens to our pattern. This is resistance in color plot. So blue is low resistance, nearly superconducting. And these are the nodes that separate the different lobes here where the resistance approaches the normal state resistance. But what we noticed is that when you increase this magnetic field, now we're up to one Tesla in plane. Uh, all the pattern disappears, so the system looks like normal. Uh, and then it reappears. So something is yet again maybe oscillatory. You'll see an explanation in just a bit. This time not as a function of the perpendicular flux, which we understand. It's just the interference effect. Uh, here it's something that has to do with the in-plane magnetic field that kills superconductivity and revives it yet again. Uh, to get a better phenomenological picture of what we have in the system, let's look at uh, the density dependence as well. So whereas here we're plotting everything as a function of the perpendicular magnetic field, we're going to just take this kind of zero flux slice where we see maximum superconductivity going away and then coming back up. And we plot this slice right here. This is the density at which it was taken. So you see zero resistant, it peaks and then something comes back. And now we're going to do it for different densities and different magnetic fields. And the way we construct this diagram is by taking these kind of Fraunhofer pl plots. For each one of these slices, we could do it vertically or horizontally. And what you get is something that you can think of as a phase diagram, where everywhere where it's zero, the system is superconducting. And then it undergoes a transition to these pockets here, three pockets, under which the system uh, restores superconductivity. And what I'd like to argue in particular for this pocket here is that this is going to turn out to be a topological superconductor. And the general physics that governs this transition, this phase transition, is that of the FFLO phase. And I'll, I'll spend some time explaining how we know this. OK, so we're dealing with a normal metal that, unlike the ferromagnet, uh, doesn't have one spin species in the inner and the other in the outer Fermi surface. We have strong spin orbit interaction in the absence of any magnetic field. So the inner Fermi surface has this kind of textured spin, spin momentum locking. And the outer one has the opposite spin momentum locking. And 
as I explained earlier, we want to create conventional pairs. Conventional pairs consist of singlets and net zero momentum. And you can see how easy it is to construct it out of this kind of spin orbit material. Uh, the up-down component is within the inner Fermi surface. It has net zero momentum. And the down-up component is in the outer Fermi surface and also has zero net momentum. So this pair has all the components, ingredients that we want. Singlet, net zero momentum, it's really happy. It's very, it's very happy to, uh, to form using a conventional superconductor. Now, the interesting thing happens when we apply the in-plane magnetic field. Uh, it turns out, not too hard to see, that when you apply an in-plane magnetic field along the x, let's say the y direction, the two Fermi surfaces shift slightly in the y direction. And the reason they do it is because uh, the spins that are perpendicular to the magnetic field here in the north and south, they don't care about the magnetic field. Right or left is the same, so their energy is unshifted. Whereas the ones that are aligned or anti-aligned, their energy shifts. So it's easy to see that this Fermi surface simply gets distorted. Uh, and this is in the limit where the magnetic field is weak compared to the spin-orbit interaction. Now, despite the fact that the magnetic field is weak compared to the spin-orbit interaction, it turns out that this kind of shift in momentum, delta K, between the two Fermi surfaces, is only governed by Zeeman, by the Zeeman energy and the dispersion, the velocity. So despite the fact that spin-orbit is needed, as long as the magnetic field is weak compared to spin-orbit interaction, this shift in momentum doesn't care about spin-orbit interaction at all. Now, if we want to look at what happened to our singlet wave function now, so you see that the up-down acquired a finite momentum, it moved a little bit to the right, and the down-up acquired a little bit of a momentum also in the opposite direction. So now, this wave function is no longer a simple singlet. Uh, not hard to see that we can write this wave function as a cosine of this delta k times w, the distance between the two superconductors, times a singlet component. And then there is a sine component times a triplet. And you see here already the oscillatory nature of this order parameter, uh, very much like the FFLO phase that I described initially, and also in the induced superconductivity in the hybrid normal superconductor ferromagnet, you see the two order parameters oscillating and when one peaks, the other one vanishes. Now, there is something really unique about the fact that this is a spin-orbit material, and that is, what happens if we consider other pathways between this source, let's say, and any other endpoint? Let's take a diagonal. Because the shift in momentum is only along one direction, spatial direction, the total phase that you will acquire here is still given by delta kW. It's only the projection along the x-axis because that's the direction where momentum is shifting. So this wave function is invariant to any trajectory that you will choose. And so as you're summing up all these pathways, you get constructive interference. And in fact, this is indeed the order parameter for this device, regardless of how you're going from one side to the other. Uh, one could simulate what the critical current in this SNS device will be and one indeed finds that it vanishes at when the condition delta kW is pi over 2 when this cosine um, vanishes and then reappears and I want to say two important things about this disappearance and reappearance so first of all why is the supercurrent disappearing when the singlet part is going away remember we have a singlet superconductor aluminum separated by some material, a semiconductor, and another aluminum. What we're learning is that as the pair was injected from this superconductor, it propagates and it changes its nature. It starts as a singlet, but as it moves, it changes from singlet to triplet, etc. At this condition exactly here, the singlet component vanishes, which means that the pairs that arrive at the other superconductor are purely triplets. They can't enter the aluminum. The aluminum wants singlets and therefore the critical current vanishes. So this condition is the condition in which we have pure triplet pairing in this device. The other aspect is that if we continue to increase the magnetic field, we see that the singlet part reemerges, the triplet starts to vanish again, but it comes back with the opposite sign. And this will become very important when I talk about topological superconductivity in these devices, because when the phase difference across the two, this junction 
changes from zero to pi, which is what happens when the order parameter switches sign, the system will become topological. Now, interestingly enough, this explains what happens here. If we look at the lobe here, this uh, reemergence of superconductivity, we see a slightly different Fraunhofer pattern. Note that in this one, everything disappeared at this critical field and then reemerged. For this lobe itself, we see something different. We see that the central lobe goes away, but the side lobes are merging. They're flowing in. So there's a little bit of a different physics that takes place. And it turns out that we can understand this physics exactly based on this itinerant ferromagnet picture. So here I plotted the inner Fermi surface having one spin species and the outer Fermi surface has it having the other. And if you now compute what happens to a trajectory going from x1 to x2, again, when you try to write this wave function, each one of these up, down, and down, up components acquires a momentum, just like the FFLO case. Only now, the phase difference does depend on the trajectory that we take. It's no longer only the horizontal one, because here, regardless on what diagonal you choose, you always have a, a momentum to the pair. It's isotropic. Uh, if you now simulate this particular case, you exactly get these kind of Fraunhofer patterns. Instead of them vanishing and re-emerging, they actually, uh, the central lobe disappears, the side ones merge in, uh, and this continues on and on as you increase magnetic field. And again, very similar to the uh, FFLO picture, as magnetism, as you increase magnetic field further and further, the magnitude of this critical current will diminish, whereas here it does not diminish. In principle, it should remain constant. So this is the advantage of the spin orbit regime rather than the Zeeman regime. So, so what we understand now is that this, these two lobes here correspond to a uh, pure triplet superconductor that exa exists exactly at this transition. Here we converge onto uh, the opposite sign and we're dominated by spin orbit interaction and here we're dominated by Zeeman and spin orbit is weak, is not important. And in fact, we don't really know why we're going from one regime to the other except for the fact that as we're changing density, the Rashba spin orbit interaction might be affected by the electric fields and we might be making it smaller, but we really don't have a good microscopic understanding. Above this, uh, you could measure it above the PC. Uh, so it's not so easy to measure. Uh, you need really high density. So people have done it, but not in these very... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So people have seen it, and indeed they've seen that uh, you have... Um, no, I'm saying to measure the strength, that you could maybe measure it as well. Going above the yeah, but, but you can do it in bigger samples, not in the, in the narrow one. Yeah, so it, it, ma it makes it a little bit hard. Yeah. At the same time? Stuff. Yeah, you can make a separate big one, but the electric fields, etc., that you will find inside the narrow junction and also the densities are not going to be the same. So it, it so forms some complications. Is because this, the, the sample is not totally symmetric or what? Which, oh, here. Right, yeah. No, this has to do with compensating. So, you know, we're applying a very large magnetic field in plane and we're probing it with a very small perpendicular magnetic field. So if there is a slight tilt, yeah in the angle, we will be mixing the two and, and the thing will start running away. Okay, so um, these results uh, basically uh, stimulated a theoretical discussion that we undertook to really understand this device better. And so we looked at exactly this device that I was mentioning. You have a semiconductor here, this light uh, pinkish thing and the two superconductors on top. And remember, in our measurements, what we were controlling was the in-plane magnetic field, and we were controlling current across the device. Let's imagine we do something else. Instead of controlling current, we're going to control the phase difference across these two superconductors. And this is not hard to do. You simply connect a loop across these two superconductors and you thread some flux, and that will change the phase difference across the two superconductors. In general, in a superconducting device, you could either control the current and then the phase is determined, or you control the phase and then the current is determined. So here we want to control the phase. So there are two variables in this device. There is the phase and there is the magnetic field. And what it turns out when you analyze this device is that actually it nearly half of the space forms a topological superconductor. 
And the reason has to do with the fact that when the phase difference is nearly pi, uh, and there is a magnetic field on, the number of Andrea bound states that live in this, uh, in this junction here necessarily has to be odd. And that's why when the phase difference is pi, at least conceptually, the system is always topological. Now, this diagram doesn't show the size of the gap, but if the distance between the two superconductors is narrow, the size of the gap can reach the size of the superconducting gap. Now, I'm sure you've heard a lot about various ways of generating topological superconductivity and Majorana bound states. So first of all, the fact that this becomes a topological superconductor in these green domains says that there necessarily are these localized Majorana zero modes. This is the fact that this is a topological superconductor. It has its states. Uh, and they're here. Now, in other implementations like nanowires, etc., what we learn is that they really require fine tuning. You need to position the chemical potential at the right place, and you need a particular, you know, a range of magnetic fields, etc. The interesting thing about this design is that it's really independent of where the chemical potential is. It's robust. For every chemical potential, this phase diagram holds. It's nearly independent of magnetic field, namely. Uh, except zero magnetic field, but any other magnetic field, you see you have a topological phase. And in principle, also independent to the distance between the two superconductors, W. These parameters will control the magnitude of the topological gap, but would not control its presence, whether it's there or not. So this is really cool because basically this is a topological switch. By just changing the phase across the two superconductors, you can enter the topological phase or exit uh, and uh, thereby create or eliminate these Majorana zero modes. Now, remember that um, I mentioned to you that when we are in this phase, the system develops a pi junction. The phase difference is pi. And what I told you here is that when the phase difference is pi, the system is actually topological. And so what we know now theoretically is that as you ramp the magnetic field, if you're controlling the current, what happens is that at some value of magnetic field, indeed the system will want to switch to the topological phase, creating a phase difference of pi and entering the topological phase. And this is exactly the condition, this is exactly what is happening in this corner. The system here is switching from zero to pi phase, and this is therefore a topological uh, the topological regime and the experiments that are undergoing right now in the lab is really to try to see some signatures for example, in tunneling. So here are some predicted spectra where you look at the tunneling into the system in the bulk, where you see nothing, where the phase difference is pi versus uh, the edge, where now you see a zero bias anomaly characteristic of these kind of zero uh, Majorana zero modes. So uh, with this, I'd like to summarize. Uh, I think this is really a rich system. It's a hybrid um, topological uh, basically topological superconductor. It's artificial. It has a lot of knobs. We can really turn things on and off. Uh, and I'd like to particularly highlight this triplet pairing here, these three students, Sean, Hetchen, and Michael, that have really uh, pushed this project through. Uh, the theory part was done in collaboration with uh, Falco, Anna, Adi Stern, and Eris Berg, and also in collaboration with Bert Halperin. Uh, and we've benefited a lot from collaborating with Lawrence Mollenkamp in particular on the materials. Thank you.